Hey guys, Mr. Starkey here. Well, this is the last of my teaching videos for the seniors. Juniors, you still have a couple of lessons to go, but this is the last one for the seniors. And seniors want to tell you guys I love you and I'm really proud of you. And what a great year this has been. I know fourth quarter has been so odd, um, but uh, it's been great to be with you guys. And last year when you were juniors as well. Um, so again, this is the last teaching video for the seniors, juniors, you still have a couple of more to go, uh, a couple of more assignments to go after this, but I thought I would wrap up our um, semester on what is, on this topic, what is the goal of studying Christian ethics? You know, first semester we talked a lot about critical thinking, you guys did great on that, and then second semester we've been talking about all these different ethical issues from a Christian worldview. So here are some things that I hope were accomplished. Uh, during this semester. Um, number one, uh, I hope we accomplish the goal of changing from instinctive to informed ethical convictions. Uh, what I mean by that is that my guess is coming into Bible class this year, you instinctively knew there were some things that were right, some things that were wrong, uh, but maybe you just didn't know exactly why. Maybe you didn't have a lot of biblical reasons why, um, or just a lot of um, arguments for why you believe what you believe. So I hope after um, studying Christian ethics this, this second semester, your instinctive understanding of certain things has become more informed. Uh, for example, uh, we probably knew as Christians already that abortion was wrong, that killing a preborn baby in the mother's womb would be wrong. Maybe we just didn't have a lot of biblical reasons why or other reasons. And so uh, hopefully studying Christian ethics this year, this semester has helped inform um, how the Bible does teach um, about abortion. You're right, there's no verse that says that's why I'm not having an abortion, but based on what the Bible is clear on, things like human life begins at the moment of conception and God loves the preborn baby um, in the mother's womb all the way up to the senior adult from the womb to the tomb and uh, all those kinds of things we, that the Bible is clear on, we can infer from those things what the Bible says about abortion, which is abortion would be wrong. Um, so hopefully you have a better scriptural understanding of what you instinctively knew about abortion being wrong. Um, also, if you'll remember, we talked about how philosophy agrees with what the Bible says, um, that it's not just a life, it is a human life um, there in the mother's womb from the moment of conception. And also science backs it up as well that at that moment of conception, when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, um, that spark of life, at that moment, 46 chromosomes are present, and those chromosomes already determine the baby's uh, height and hair color and eye color, and is he or she gonna be left-handed or right-handed and those kinds of things. So again, maybe instinctively, we knew some things about abortion, but having studied um, Christian ethics, hopefully, your um, instinctual understanding of an issue like abortion has become more informed. And also, um, hopefully, um, your understanding of some of these issues has helped you understand other issues. For example, when we got to stem cell research, um, we understood that if embryonic stem cell research requires that the preborn baby die, then we would be against it. Why? Because we had already learned that abortion would be wrong. So again, instinctively, we knew some things, but hopefully after having studied Christian ethics and Bible class this year, we have um, better reasons and more reasons for believing what we instinctively already knew to be true. Here's a second goal to change from imprecise to accurate ethical convictions. Again, this is the idea that maybe coming into class, you had a vague understanding of an issue but having studied Christian ethics, now you know a little bit better um, how the Bible's teachings apply to that particular issue. Like, for example, most recently when we did the assignment on what the Bible says about suicide, um, I really appreciated the answers that you guys gave to my questions on the issue of what the Bible says about suicide. And a lot of you mentioned you were surprised, number one, that the Bible has a lot to say about suicide. Like the Bible says that it is murder, it's self-murder and that it's never God's will that someone take their own life, and God would never lead us to a, a place where the only um, and best option would be to take your own life. And also that um, suicide is actually an act against faith, because faith says, I'm going to trust God to see me through this. And then, of course, probably more than half of, of you guys, juniors and seniors both, 
Um, just mention that you had thought that um, if a Christian committed suicide, it meant that they lost their salvation, that they automatically went to hell. And of course, we studied that scripture does not teach that, that the Bible um, says that our relationship with Christ does not go in and out of existence every time we sin, and that would include the sin of suicide, but that we are secure in Christ. And it is possible for a Christian to lose sight and sense of reality and reach a point where they're so disoriented and confused, or maybe there's a chemical imbalance that the Christian takes his or her own life, um, and that it's never God's will, but God doesn't call them home, but God does welcome them home. So anyway, with number two there on your screen, maybe you, again, had some ideas as to why kind of vaguely suicide would be wrong, but now maybe the, your understanding is a little bit more accurate, having studied Christian ethics. Number three, to change from unbiblical to biblical ethical convictions. We spent a lot of time talking about why the Bible is the only ultimate objective source of authority when it comes to determining right and wrong. I mean, the only other option is that you and I decide ultimately what's right and wrong, but that, that doesn't work for a lot of reasons. I mean, number one, we would all human beings would never agree on everything that's right and wrong. And then also, um, if you and I disagree about right and wrong, who's to say that your opinion is any more valuable or authoritative than my opinion, right? So that's called moral relativism, right? Where it's all just kind of up in the air. But we learn that the Bible coming from a perfect God is going to be the perfect authority um, so we can always know what's right and wrong. So I don't know, maybe you came into Bible class this year with some um, convictions, some opinions, some beliefs on ethical issues that didn't really line up with the Bible. So I'm hoping that as a result of our class um, this year, you know, you have a little stronger biblical foundation for, uh, for what you believe. Okay, and then uh, here's number four, to prepare to face real life challenges. This is something that's real important to me, and that is that as a result of studying Christian ethics this year, this semester in particular, that you feel better equipped to um, face the challenges that you're dealing with right now in your life and that you're gonna deal with when you head off to whatever the Lord has for you um, after high school. Um, you know, hopefully you feel a little, better, a little better equipped at, at discerning right from wrong um, or good, better, and best, right? Um, hopefully you have a stronger foundation for what you believe. And again, I just wanna remind you that um, you don't have to believe what the Bible says. Again, you have a free will to choose not to, but I would just ask you to have good reasons for what you do believe. If you want to believe something that is opposite of what the Bible says is true, you have the free will to do that. You can do that. Just make sure you have better reasons for believing that what you believe is right than what the Bible says is right. So hopefully as a result of our studies this year, um, you've learned to be a, a better thinker. And also, you know, facing challenges about what am I going to do, you know, as a career, um, you know, relationships, and pretty much everything in life. When we study um, Christian ethics, one of the goals is to prepare us to face these real life challenges. So all this stuff that we've learned, you guys, this year and this semester, it's not just theory. It's not just for the sake of taking some tests and moving on. It's not just data or information that we'll just forget once we're done taking the test. Rather, it really does put tools in our toolbox to face real life challenges. And then number five, a goal of studying Christian ethics was to gain a better ability to make wise ethical decisions about ethical issues that, that haven't occurred yet, new matters that are gonna come up later. I mean, think about it, you know, 50 years ago, talking about human cloning, I mean, nobody was talking about that, but now, you know, it's a very popular thing to talk about, and so, um, you know, who knows what the issues are going to be in two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now that people right now aren't even thinking about. So studying Christian ethics can prepare us to be able to deal with those issues when they come about. Global warming, that wasn't a thing, again, even 25 years ago, but now you hear about it almost every day. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, I mean, that's a real thing. Uh, you know, last generation, it was just the stuff of science fiction movies, right? Um, so again, Hopefully, what you've learned in class this year not only helps you now, but is preparing you to think through issues that will come up in the future. 
you know, we've all put puzzles together, you have, I have. The more pieces you can get to fit together in the puzzle, um, the easier the puzzle gets, right? If you just start off with a couple of pieces, it's hard. But once you get 20, 30, 40 pieces together, it's easier to find where the leftover pieces fit. Well, our thinking is that way. Um, you've put a lot of pieces to the puzzle together in your mind this year, in your thinking process. And so you have every reason to be confident that, again, in 5 or 10 or 20 years, these ethical issues that nobody's even thought of right now that are going to come up, um, you're going to be okay. You're going to be able to think through those things. And I'm excited about the future, knowing that you guys are going to be um, calling the shots, um, your generation, um, with regard to what's right and wrong and what's good and what's bad. And, and you're going to lead our country and you're going to lead churches and you're going to lead your families and your children in a good direction. And, um, and a lot of it is because I hope um, this year, maybe we were able to put a few pieces to the puzzle together so that when these new issues come up in the future, you can handle those because you know how to think through these issues. And then number six, this one's really important to me, um, that a goal of studying Christian ethics is that you would grow toward Christian maturity. Look at this verse in Hebrews 5.14, solid food is for the mature. I feel like this school year, well, one of my aims anyway, I don't know, I hope I did a good job. But one of my aims was to give you solid food, right? Not just milk <laughs> in Bible class, but just some really good stuff for you to think about, to mentally, intellectually chew upon. And, um, and I hope we've had some good solid food this year in Bible class for you, spiritually and intellectually thinking. And notice that verse says, um, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And remember, that's what ethics is all about, is, you know, learning what's good, learning what's evil. And so that's what we've been doing this year, is training our powers of discernment by constant practice so we can tell what's good and what's evil from God's point of view. So I hope, again, that this year, especially this second semester in studying Christian ethics, has, again, been more than just information. I hope, I hope you feel like you've progressed in your spiritual life. I hope you feel like you've grown in your daily walk with the Lord, just being able to think through issues a little bit better. And then number seven, a goal of studying Christian ethics is to be better equipped to share and defend the Christian faith. Um, you're ready. You're going to be fine. You can share your faith with people in ways that they've never heard the faith shared before. Um, you're creative thinkers. You're, you're intelligent. You're good, sharp, strong, critical thinkers. And, um, and God's going to use you to share the gospel in unique, creative ways, and also to defend the Christian faith. And those are goals of studying Christian ethics, is to, again, help you be better able to share the faith, and if and when your faith is attacked, to stand your ground and to defend the faith. I want to wrap up our lesson with this verse, 1 Peter 3.15, In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Let's pause right there. What's that mean? It means simply put Christ first. Here's what I would say to you guys as we approach the end of this school year. If, if you'll put Christ first in your life, everything else in your life will line up. I'm not saying it'll be easy, but I'm saying it will all work out. It will all line up. Um, I'm wearing this shirt that buttons. I'll see if I can show a little bit of it to you. You can see the buttons here on the shirt, right? And if I start to uh, button my shirt and I start in the middle and the buttons don't line up with the holes, what happens? The, the shirt gets crooked, right? But if I start at the top or if I start at the bottom um, of the shirt and I get the first button right, all the, other, all the rest of the buttons line up with the holes, right? So what am I saying? I'm saying that when you put Christ first in your life, everything else is going to line up. Put him first and he will, he will make sure that everything that he wants you to have, wants you to experience, will come your way. Uh, Matthew 6.33 says kind of the same thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So back to 1 Peter 3, 15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. And then look at the next part. Always being prepared. Hey, keep learning. Keep, keep your thinking sharp, okay? Keep growing intellectually. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. I love it, okay? That reason idea. Again, that critical thinking, right? A reason for what? For the hope that is in you. Unfortunately, a lot of times we Christians are only known for what we're against. 
And that's important because we do have to take a stand against evil. But we also want the world to know that we are for good things. And Christianity in Christ is really all about hope, right? Um, all of the good things that God has planned for us. God has a plan for us, and it's a good plan. He has a plan for the world, and it's a good plan. So um, that scripture saying, put Christ first, be prepared to make a defense, and be ready with your reasons for why you believe what you believe, and always focus on the hope. Live your life out of a place of hope. And then the last part says, do it with gentleness and respect. Love that ver verse, 1 Peter 3.15. Well, guys, here are some questions I'd like for you to answer. Now, there's five on your screen, but as a little gift um, for our seniors, um, all of you guys, juniors and seniors alike, only need to answer numbers four and five, okay? You don't have to answer numbers one, two, and three. I mean, I guess you can if you want. No, it won't be extra credit, um, but only answer numbers four and five, everybody, juniors and seniors, um, just as a little gift to the seniors on behalf of the seniors. and. Um, about the only way you're going to miss any points on this assignment is if you don't answer them. So uh, give me something. But look at number four. Write a note to Mr. Starkey about something you liked um, in this year's Bible class or something you learned about in this year's Bible class, something that was meaningful to you, something that made a difference in your life. Um, it would really encourage me to know that um, our class provided something for you that, I don't know, that you really liked, that you benefited from. Let me know what that was. And would you do me a favor for number four? Don't just write one or two words. Give me a couple of sentences. Write me a note, a personal note about what you thought about our class this year, okay? Um, and then number five, what advice would you give to me for making next year's Bible class better? So uh, next year's Bible class, this year was on um, Christian ethics. Next year, it's going to be on apologetics. So all of you guys, juniors and seniors alike, let me know in number five what I can do to make it better. I prefer you not just say, oh, you're doing great, Mr. Stark. You don't change a thing. Give me something, okay? Um, I really want to know what you think. I, I want to do the best I can to make the classes good for you guys. And um, so, again, to clarify, you don't have to answer one, two, and three. Everybody, juniors and seniors alike, only answer numbers four and five. So this is my last teaching video for our seniors. Juniors, you still have a couple of lessons to go yet. Um, but again, seniors, I just want to say to you, I love you. I'm proud of you. And uh, you've really made a difference in my life. And I've grown a lot just from knowing you guys in the classroom and personally. And uh, thank you for who you are. Keep serving the Lord. And I'm super proud of you. Love you guys. Bye.